The next major economic indicator is the unemployment rate. And there are some misconceptions about the, what this actually means. The unemployment rate is a calculation of the number of people, the percentage of the population that is unemployed out of the available labor force. So how do you actually come up with this percentage? Number of people who are officially unemployed divided by the number of people who are officially part of the labor force. Now, who is included in the labor force? People who are employed. People who are officially unemployed. And that's it. It's not your total population. If you are employed or unemployed, you're in the labor force. And we want the number of unemployed divided by that to give us a percentage. Now, who is not included in these numbers? It's an awful lot of people. So if that's all the people included in the labor force, then who isn't counted? Anybody who's not looking for a job. If you are retired, if you are not trying to work, you know, stay-at-home parents. They're not in the labor force. If you are a student and you're not looking for a job, you don't count. If you are institutionalized and you're unable to work, you're in prison, you're in a hospital, you're in a mental institution, you don't count. If you are too young to legally work, which in most states is below age 16, in some states it's below age 15, you don't count. So there's an awful lot of people in your population who aren't part of these numbers. And where it really gets kind of sticky in terms of who's not counted is the fact that we leave out what are called discouraged workers. Discouraged workers are people who have been looking for a job so long that they just give up. When they give up and they stop applying for jobs, they fall out of these numbers. So if the national unemployment rate today is creeping up on 10%, how high would it be if we actually counted all the discouraged workers? It would be a lot worse because in reality, the picture is more grim than it looks. If you go on BLS.gov, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and you look at state-by-state -state data, for example, there was one month in the past year when the unemployment rate for the state of Michigan dropped. Does that mean that people in Michigan were going back to work in large numbers? No, it probably means that they gave up. And the fact that that unemployment rate went down is not necessarily a positive thing. So you have to look at fluctuations in these numbers from a dual perspective. Is it a positive because people go back to work? Is it a negative because they've fallen out of the statistics? And this understates the unemployment rate and complicates the picture and makes it that much uglier. The next thing that we want to do with unemployment is look at different categories of unemployed workers. Most textbooks only include three. I'm going to give you four just in case you happen to see all of them. The first one is frictional unemployment. The way I've always thought about this one is this is the take this job and shove it unemployment. You know? If, if you know the, the, the lovely uh, Johnny Paycheck song. Frictional unemployment means that you have job skills. 
You are employable, but you are not currently working. If you are frictionally unemployed, it means that you're looking for a job and somebody could hire you, it just hasn't happened yet. If you are a recent college graduate and you're looking for work for the first time, you're frictional. Okay? To a certain extent, frictional unemployment is absolutely avoidable in the economy, which is why full employment does not mean 0% unemployment, because you're always going to have somebody who's between jobs. So that's the first one. Now, the next one, which is the worst one up here probably, is structural. Structural unemployment is bad. It is the hardest one to address. It is the worst one to try to fix. Because if you are structurally unemployed, it means that your job skills are outdated, and nobody can hire you. Let's say, for example, that you worked on an assembly line for 30 years, and boom, you get replaced by a robot, and you can't do anything else. If you think that does not happen in the United States, then go walk around the campus of any community college and count the number of people you see who are over age 40, or over age 50, or over age 60. Because the only thing you can do if you are structurally unemployed is get some, uh, some further job training or education so that you are employable again. This is bad, okay? Structural unemployment is bad. If we put those two together, frictional and structural unemployment, if we combine those two things, then that gives us our natural rate of unemployment. It also means that this number is never going to be zero, and thus to have full employment, you're always going to have a certain level of unemployment. The benchmark that economists have used for as long as I've been doing any of this is about 5% unemployment. Now. During the late 1990s, when the economy was doing really well, right before the tech bubble burst and all of that you know, completely disintegrated, um, leading us into 9-11 and, and the near death of the airline industries and everything we've been dealing with in the past eight years after that, when the economy was really good in the late 90s, people started to think that full un unemployment was maybe closer to 4%. Um, but the thinking on that really has not changed across the board. Most of the time, you'll still see 5% as kind of the benchmark, the, uh, benchmark number. All right, so those two are the ones that we really, you know, on the whole can't deal with very well. The third one is cyclical. It's cyclical because it's related to business cycles. What that means is, during a recession, there are people who get laid off. There are people in certain industries who are most likely to get laid off and suffer from cyclical unemployment. People in construction. That would be one of the industries, and heavy manufacturing tends to get hit pretty hard. The last one, which most books leave out, is seasonal. That just means that there are fluctuations in the level of employment that happen at different times of the year. For example, stores hire a whole bunch of people for the holiday rush, and they lay them all off in January and February. There are an awful lot more cabbage picking jobs in late fall than there are the rest of the year. Exactly. So again, most books only have these three. You may see seasonal, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. 